Sojourner Howard's event, and we are live at La Prade Library. If you want to make it, you can. We're just getting started, and there's still plenty of cookies left. So if you didn't come, you missed cookies. And once my sons get to them, that will be the end of that. Yeah. Today, we are going to be featuring my second book, which is Bought Lessons. And I'm going to stop using the word my, because really this is a family project. So I'm going to say our. This is our project, Bought Lessons. What is Bought Lessons about? Well, before I tell you what it's about, you would kind of need to understand the backstory, okay? Because it's hard to understand where I'm at now if you didn't know where I was. And the hero of this story, as always, is not me, it's God. You all know I'm a woman of faith, so you are going to hear about the Lord. That is what I'm going to talk about. You make your own judgments. I just need to supply you the information. So you guys ready? Here we go. Art Lessons. First of all, while I'm starting, let me tell you about what I didn't want to do. I did not want to write a book. I did not want to be a suburban housewife. I didn't want to be a housewife, period. I did not want to walk around here and call success a minivan and being at home with my children. I have degrees, I have talent, I have the gift of gab, and I'm cute. So why would we want to keep all of that in the house? Well. What I wanted and what the Lord wanted, two different things. And since he's the hero, heroes always win. So he won out. And you know what he did? He took everything from me. That's what he did. He stripped me of everything that I thought that was important to me. You know how Paul says, if you're familiar with the story, everything, I'm the Hebrew of Hebrews, I'm this is that and the third, and he's given his pedigree, the tribe of Benjamin, and all of that. <coughs> But I count it all dumb, because that's really what it means, poo-poo, in comparison to what I've gained from the Lord. Now I understand that scripture. Because what I held on to, success, six-figure check, you know, everyone knowing my name, corner office, a driver, <laughs> being able to go when I wanted to go, eat where I wanted to eat, and kind of just tell people what to do because I was the head honcho because I had it like that. No. Not so much. Not at all. One day I fell in love with a blue-collar man, and he changed my world. And not only did I fall in love with him, but we made several expressions of love. Mm -hmm. Elon Michael, who is in heaven, we will get to see him again, so I will not say that he's lost because we know where he is. Mm -hmm. And we have Miles, Carlin Anthony, our eldest son. We have Nathan Xavier, which you all have heard me talk about a lot. And we also have Alyssa Nicole, who's not here right now. Those were not only gifts, as children are, but they're also instruments of humbling. Mm -hmm. And each one of those kids gave me something different. Miles tested my patience. I'm impatient. I got to have it now. I'm on microwave time. If I had to ask you for it, it's too late. Mm -hmm. Miles is autistic. I had to learn Miles. I had to learn Miles' temperament. I had to learn what Miles understood. I had to learn that what I think he knows and what he actually knows, it doesn't line up. And so who needs to be flexible? Him? He's the child. Who needs to be flexible? Mm -hmm. okay. The thing I love about the Lord so much is that when he is changing you, when he is molding you, he doesn't let you know that he's doing it. You just notice it by your behavior and your reactions to certain things. Mm -hmm. Okay? You notice when you don't get upset over things that used to upset you. You notice when you're trying to watch your mouth or hold it in. You notice when you want to go do something else, but yet you can't because you're thinking of the other person that's in your life, and you sit that down. You would think that that's just a thing that mothers do. That's a thing that wives do. Not everybody does that. Why do you think we have divorce? Because people are selfish and are self-centered, mm -hmm. and they don't understand the meaning of sacrifice. Mm -hmm. They help me understand sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So now, here I am. Working at a dead end job because they always ended dead end. I would go up to the top not understanding what the favor of God was, and I would move up very, very quickly, and then there would be nothing for me to do. It's like the dog that catches the mailman. Once you catch the mailman, what do you do? You're like, okay, now what? And I quit and I move on to something else because nothing would satisfy me. So now, dead end job, three babies, 
And what do I decide to do? Go to school. A friend told me you're not getting anywhere here. You are black and you are a female. And I'm sorry, but all the civil rights laws and all the acts and all of this and all of that cannot change certain people's mindsets. There is still separatism, there is still racism, and there's still sexism that's out there. And I use racism lightly because I believe everything that the Bible says. And if what is in the Bible is true, not an if, I'm putting that in quotations because I just qualified that and said I believe it. Ham was one of Noah's sons. You know the ark, the rainbow? Okay, the rainbow stands for God's covenant that he will not destroy the earth again by water. Nothing else. I don't care how they change it. That's what it stands for. Noah had a son named Ham. Ham had a bunch of people. He had a bunch of kids. He had white kids, black kids, Asian kids, Polynesian. He had them all colors. Green. If you find somebody green, that's one of Ham. So actually, we all come from the same tribe. So I use racism lightly. But there are people who will not like me because of the color of my skin. Let's put it that way. I am African American. I am Native American, and probably a whole bunch of other things I would have to get a DNA test to try to figure out what I am. But I know I'm a child of God, so that is all that matters to me. However, when you're in the workplace, there are people that will look at you and decide that this is entitlement, that you are filling a government quota. I have to have so many females, and out of those females, I have to have so many this minority, this minority, and that minority. But it doesn't say that I have to move you up. And even though it says equal pay for equal time, if I never tell you what somebody else makes, then you won't know what it is that you're making. So how do you know it's equal? Okay, it still exists in corporate America. All right. So now, back to the story. We're at dead end job. I need to go to school. One of my coworkers told me, go to school, get your degree, make them pay for it. Once you have your degree, you can go off and you can do anything. I was like, that's a good idea because I was disgusted and I was stuck and I knew I was. So I went to school with three babies, a full-time job, a husband, and I kept going. And I kept going. Six years, semester after semester, taking one semester off in the summer. They tell me what God will not do. How do you do that? I can't take two classes now without falling apart, let alone try to take a full schedule. During this time, we found out Miles was autistic. We found out that Nathan had prune belly syndrome. Uh, which is a set of congenital deformities. Alyssa had to adjust. Not only was it not just her and mommy, because this is a blended relationship, because I'm used to living outside of God's calling. So I have an expression of love that I'm bringing with me. So now I have to deal with this. Not just mommy and me. It's me, mom, and my dad. Now it's me, mom, my dad, and my brother, and another brother. And all of a sudden, nobody's paying attention to me because... It's a whole bunch going on with my brothers. She got into a lot of trouble because my attention was divided. Her dad's attention was divided. Our house was divided. But I kept going to school. And at the end of this thing, I had two masters, one an MBA and one in secondary education. So at the end of this, okay, it's like, you know, the prize at the end, you know, when you won a waste, you expect to get a prize. You win an Indy 500, you get $50 million in endorsements. Everybody loves you. You win in the Olympics, you get the little wreath on your head, and you get, you, like, set for life because you're going to be on a Wheaties box. I expected, when I finished my degrees, that I would get a prize. And my prize was the six-figure job that I wanted that would give me the security to take care of my family because I've got God. I've got him. But it ain't Christmas. It ain't Easter. It's not a catastrophe. Right. It's not a death. I got God part-time. He flipped that because he said that there will be no other gods in front of me. I am a jealous God. And if this six-figure job is what you need to give you security, which is going to replace me, you cannot have it. I love you so much, I'm not going to give it to you. So at the end of my degrees, and after I graduated, and after we went out to dinner, and I started searching for jobs, nothing. I couldn't get a job at McDonald's. I couldn't get anything at Walmart. I'm going into job places and I'm telling people what to do on the interview. They're asking me about computer programs. I'm like, excuse me, let me see your computer. Da -da -da -da. This is how you do this. this is... In one of my interviews, I organized a man's files and he was interviewing me. <laughs> University of 
University of Richmond said you are the fourth candidate. Yay! What does that mean to me? Do you ever see somebody taking fourth place getting a medal? Oh, okay, it's gold, silver, bronze. What is it, nickel? No, you get nothing. You get a thank you and try again. All the doors were shut. You know why? Because God was serious about dealing with me. And the one thing that he set in me to do that nobody else could do. So Jerna had to do it because that's what I said was going to happen. And my words have power. And if I've already assigned this to this child, I'm not taking it because I don't give gifts and take them back. So guess what? You are going to have to learn how to work with me. And I'm going to teach you by giving you these babies. Okay, fine. So now we've got degrees. We've got a disgruntled mom. We've got two babies with autism. We have an uh, older child. We have our husband. And I'm trying to balance the fact that what I want is not going to happen. What I think should happen is not going to happen. How I think our lives ought to connect is not going to happen. What is my idea of a picture-perfect family is not my reality, okay? My perfect is them. That's my perfect. But my perfect had to change from here to what it was that God gave me, okay? So now, what do I do with this time that I have? I'm disgusted. I'm disgruntled. And God has closed all the doors. So what else can I do? Go to him and ask, what are you doing? Why won't you let me succeed? Oh, I'm glad you came to talk to me. Why don't we start a habit in you? I'm not going to give you the answer right away. I'm going to make you search for it. I am going to make you knock. Knock, knock, knock at the door and it shall be open. He didn't say knock once and knock twice. He said keep knocking. Because I know you. I put it in you. I know what's in you. Keep knocking. Because you're determined. And you know that I have the answers for you. So I did. And you know what he told me? You want a million dollars? You want to live like that? I gave you a million dollars. It's in your boxes, in your journals, in your pads. It's in your notebooks. It's in your hands is the point that he was giving me. It's in your hands. Everything that you want is in your hands. But until you come to me and you humble yourself to me, you will not anything but sit right here so now what do I decide to do go out and try to look for another job because <laughs> I mean you know I just need to test the waters because I'm stubborn that persistence he will use later but I'm stubborn so I go out to get another job and I know that they're going to hire me I know it the Holy Spirit's like they're getting ready to offer you the job and uh, I started crying in the interview I thought I was having a nervous breakdown I could not keep it together because while he was telling me that they're going to offer you the job, he said, you have an opportunity. Either you can step off into what you know and the mediocre, or you can step off in fantastic. Do you have enough faith to trust me? And I'm having this pull while these people are asking me these questions, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> I wish it was like a movie that could show the bubbles like that are going on in the war that's going on inside my head. And I finished my questions, and I had great interview etiquette, and I told them thank you, and I left, and I went out to my car, and I lost it. Mm. And not 24 hours later, I called the director and told them to remove me from the pool of applicants because I can't do it. And she said, do you realize that we're prepared to offer you the job? Is it a salary thing? Because we will give you what you're asking for. We need you to start like Monday. Oh my God. And I said, no, thank you. And I walked away. And then I called my daughter and I said, what is wrong with your mother? I just walked away from money. I have been working since I was 12. That's my security. That's what I know. You get a job, you get a house, you take care of your own. God said, no, I've got so much for you. Did you ever wonder how Abraham felt and Sarah when he had to leave? He left everything. His family, his folks, his cousin Boogie, yeah. his favorite store, yeah. his barber. He left and he said, Lord, where are you telling me to go? And he said, I'll let you know when you get there. Huh? I've got OCD. I need to know. I need to know everything. And you know what he's doing with me with that OCD? I have a child that asks me every day, what's for breakfast, what's for lunch, and what's for dinner? 
And I'm like, okay, Lord, <laughs> you funny. You funny. Like, I'm like, is this how you feel when I'm asking you? Where are we going? Where are we going? What are we doing? What are we doing? Where are we going? Where are we going? Where are we going? Are you sure? Are you sure? Where are we going? Where are we going? No, I want to go over here. I want to go over here. <laughs> but I walked away. And I said, okay. That was my first step into obedience. And you know how God blessed me? He gave me my answer. You were created to give me glory. Now, I need you to use that brain of yours that I gave you and figure out how is it that you can give me glory. That's what I need you to do. Come on in. If you're curious, it's come free admission. Come on in. in. You got a minute? Come sit. Station identification. So that's what he told me to do. So I went home and I did a SWOT analysis. Strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And I said, what can I do? I can talk. I can capture a crowd. I am cute. I mean, obviously, you need to put that in a plus column. <laughs> and I can write. Mm -hmm. I can write really good. So, okay, start writing. So I did. That was the first book. This introduces you to me. This talks about my family, my makeup, and it gives you a little bit more detail on the story that I just told, on how the breaking came and how painful it was because I'm stubborn and I'm ignorant and I can admit that, that I want, I want to tell God that I know better. I believe that you created the heaven and the earth. I believe that you spoke to chaos. You spoke into the darkness and you brought it to structure, but I'm not sure if I can trust you with my life. And if you all are honest, some of y'all might have already been there too, okay? This is what you get when you surrender. You know that song, um, Thy Will Be Done? Thy will be done. You know that song by that lady? I find myself here, Lord. I've done what you told me right. to do. Now what? But I would never know that my hurt, my disappointment, my expectations not being met are all part of your plan. Because you think higher than I think. Your thoughts and your ways are higher than mine. So my little tantrum about my inconvenience at this moment means nothing. What you need me to do is be where you send me. Okay? That's the background. We're on book two. I've started book three. Already signed the contract, paid the people the money. And I've started sketching out book four. I no longer ask, when am I going to be free to go back to work? Because this is my job. What do I put in my books? One does not relate to the other. I mean, they relate because it's me, and it's my family, and it's my craziness. But topic-wise, they talk about very, very different things. I'm going to be a spoiler. Spoiler alert. I am. I am. Spoiler. Spoiler alert. One of the things that God had to show me with Nathan was that, you know, we believe God for, for all his good gifts. We believe God for perfect healing. We know that he is able to do anything. We also say that little part, God will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, yeah, we say it, but we gloss over it. Well, sometimes his will ain't our will. It's not. Sometimes he takes what we want him to fix and he leaves it broke because that's his will. And I would never know that in the brokenness is where the healing and where the wholeness is. Okay? <laughs> so one day, Nathan, being a kidney patient who just celebrated two years of transplant, hallelujah, Amen. in August, Got sick. No, no, no. Clinic. He had a clinic appointment. And I was grumbling because he had a clinic appointment. And um, I took him to clinic. And it was very interesting what happened in clinic that day. I went into clinic. And if you've ever been in a hospital, it's very busy. There's never a quiet moment. You, there's never a small space. There's lots of people. Okay. And this particular time, I went into the clinic, MCB downtown. There was no one else in the room but myself and my mom and Nathan. We checked him in, waited. A mother walked in. And this is where this story picks up. Spoiler alert. This is part of it. I'm going to give it to you. 
Anyway, we had checked in at the front desk and were patiently waiting in the lobby when a young mother had walked in. She was tall and pretty and had a gentle voice. She was also pushing her baby in a stroller bed. It wasn't a buggy nor an umbrella stroller, more like one of those compatible with a pumpkin seat. Hopefully you now have an idea of what I am talking about. But as interesting as the stroller looked, that is not what drew my attention. It was the cough coming out of it. I knew the baby was in a delicate position and in my heart, I started to weep for the mom. Gingerly, she pushed the stroller and settled into a seat not too far from us. Nathan, in his curiosity, wanted to see the new baby. But I told him that she was sleeping which she was, so he should leave her alone. Okay, so that wasn't a lie. As on cue, the infant coughed and started to whine as it woke her up from a peaceful slumber. Her mother expertly clicked her tongue between her teeth. You know how you, when you're trying to soothe the baby? Never did she bring her out of the stroller. When the child returned to resting, her mom eased her tense pose and let out a muffled sigh of relief. Like you try to sit down after you had surgery, you're really sore. My mother and I smiled, and she returned the kindness. Again, we were the only ones in the lobby. No phone, no fax, nothing was going off. There was no traffic, no staff. We just at that moment. I asked her mom how old she was, and we proceeded with gentle guarded conversation because she's a complete stranger. Neither of us wanted to wake the bud, the baby, so we're whispering. As we talked, I started to see the strain on her beautiful face. And I forgot myself. It was as if I was living a dream. It was an almost out-of-body experience. So serene, so bright, and so powerful. I saw myself moving fluidly toward her, and, a, and I gently took her hand and gave her the word that God had placed on my heart for her. She cried. I cried, my mother gave muted praise, we prayed, I asked for strength for her and her family, for courage to face each day, for the assured belief that Yahweh is with her, was with her, will always be with her. Jesus, 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 touch with your healing presence as only you can. I whispered, believing God's spirit had filled up the room. How else do you explain that not one person entered the space? The phone didn't ring, and both Nathan and the baby were quiet. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. God, and thank you for divine appointments. Mm -hmm. Had he fixed Nathan, I could not have been there Amen. to talk with that lady. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stories like that mm -hmm. to help remind me that just because I didn't fix it, does not mean that it's not profitable, mm -hmm. does not mean that you're not being blessed, mm -hmm. does not mean that I'm not moving. The title of that chapter that I read that little excerpt about, mm -hmm. sometimes it is better for a mountain not to be moved. Mm -hmm. The word says if you have faith of mustard seed and you look at the mountain, you tell the mountain to be moved, it will be. Mm -hmm. It will be if it's God's will. Mm -hmm. He's giving you the power, but if he tells you no, then you have to understand it's for a higher purpose. And in our pain and in our want for comfort, there's no way that we can see that. But he knows that because he's our father and he knows that we're dust. And he doesn't expect us to understand like he understands. That's why he's God and we're not. That's what's in Walt Lessons. How did I come up with the title? Because once you buy a lesson, that's yours. <laughs> It ain't nobody else. Like oh, you got it. You understand it. Can't nobody take that from you. You will take that with you to the grave. And you will share it with other people. What am I doing? I am sharing the goodness of the Lord with other people. And I'm not being unrealistic. I'm not going to get up here and be one of these televangelists and tell you to send some money in because the, the cloth has been prayed over and expect your healing. I think that's a joke. You know why? Because your healing might not be on this side. It may be when you get to glory. But you're still healed. And so trying to explain that to people, your sin debt is healed. It doesn't mean that your natural man is going to be healed on this side. 
Some people will get cancer and it will be miraculously removed. Some people will get it and they will die. Some people will do sit-ups and push-ups and watch everything they eat, cholesterol, act right, walk right, take care of themselves, kind to everybody, and it will drop dead. Yeah. So what? Now what? Does all of that mean that because you do things a certain way, then you're guaranteed the outcome? Right. I thought it was, right. but it's not. And my children, my husband, my life, they're telling me it's not, but through it all, God is still good. He's still fantastic. He's still amazing. He's still awesome. I can praise him for that. I cannot be broken by that. Oh, I cry. Sometimes I get upset. Sometimes I have that moment where I'm like, is this really my life? Is this really my... Mm. I would love to be sitting outside, people watching, and I am trying to count pennies and go to all these and go to the store and figure out how to buy food that I'm not going to eat for other people. <laughs> when I'd rather do something else. Is this really my life? Yes, it is. Does it humble me? Yes, it does. Does it correct me? Yes, it does. Do I have more patience? Yes, I do. Is he still working on me? Absolutely. Am I so self-centered? <laughs> He's still working on that. But I think a lot about other people and I give whatever it is that I can give at the time. Because if my word that the Lord has given me via a testimony over a situation that he has delivered us from, regardless of how he decided to deliver us, if it saves a life or it inspires a person to move into greatness with the Lord, then don't you think that's worth more than anything else? We are going to die. We cannot take these bodies with us to glory. I do not want to sit up and look at my obituary and be bored. She lived, she died, these are her kids, she went to school, she leaves behind. That's boring. Sunrise, sunset. But what did I do in between that time? What did I do? Because the word assures me that only what I do for Christ is going to last. So when I get up on that day and I get to meet him, I want to be excited I want to hear him say, y'all know the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things, so now let me reward you. And he said, I'm going away to prepare a place for you. So that house, I ain't got to pay a mortgage. I ain't never got to worry about getting evicted. Hopefully it's got cable. <laughs> I'm just saying. But I know that if I don't get it here, yeah, it, what do you want me to tell you? It's not going to bother me? Yeah, it does. I'm human. Come on. I'm limited. It does. But it doesn't bother me to the point that that's the only thing that I'm searching and seeking for. Because I know that I'm doing something else. And not that you have to earn anything from God, because that's it's not a works-based relationship because we can never earn it. Okay? But when you follow his will and you're obedient, he blesses you. He put it in his word way back in Deuteronomy. And the same God of the Old Testament that moved the sea, that struck down Pharaoh, is the same God that is here today. And his word is Bob. He's made a new covenant with us, a new agreement, new promise. But the thou shall not, you know, the Ten Commandments, not the suggestions. Don't steal, don't commit adultery, don't do this, don't do that. We still adhere to that because it's still true. So in Deuteronomy... He gave Moses the blessings of obedience. Google it. Read it for yourself. And if you're obedient, I will bless you. Yeah. And I will bless your house. Well, he has. He's blessed my house. We have peace. We have a fun marriage. I'm not so stressed out because I'm not trying to make a jigsaw fit into a oil can. It's just two things that just are not meant to go together at all. Because I'm releasing it to God. And so the product and the fruit is what you're hearing, what you're going to read. That's it. And do I enjoy what I do? Absolutely. Does it challenge my marriage? Sometimes. Does it challenge us financially? Yes, it does. Because, I mean, you know, I like to blink, blink. I can't get it right now. But he told me that, you know what, I will supply all of your needs. 
And I will even give you some of your wants. And so now my prayer is, instead of God, give me, let me, let me have, is Lord, this is what I would like, but if it's going to take me <coughs> away from you, then I do not want it. Because my peace is in you. My focus is in you. My love is in you. My strength is in you. Because I have peace, and I no longer have to get to the top of something and go like, okay, well, I've done that. What's next? Because I'm satisfied. My thirst has been filled. Okay? So that's all I can encourage you to do. This book has a lot of good stuff. There are some things in there that you may not agree about. And there's some a lot of typos because this publisher was being extra special. And I basically had to edit my own work. And I am not, I'm a good writer, but I am not a good editor. So just, you know, it's your book if you buy it. Um, just mark it out. If you got a question, email me and ask me what did I mean by that, and I will tell you, okay? Um, it's full of wisdom pearls, little sayings that God gives me out of nowhere, and I have learned when he gives me something, write it down. So I have it on napkins, post-its, um, receipts, whatever. Mm -hmm. Hi, come on in. So you've got wisdom pearls. You've got poignant titles. Mm -hmm. Correction is not criticism. I got that from my daughter because in this generation, if you try to correct somebody, you're accused of judging. Right, right. <laughs> okay, it's my job to correct you. If I know better and I keep the truth from you, then guess what? Exactly. I get in trouble. Yep. And quite honestly, I'm more afraid of him than I'll ever be of you. And I get enough whoopings by myself for just being <laughs> right. <laughs> so I'm not going to take your whooping on top of that. Exactly. I don't like anybody like that, even my own kids. I'm like, uh uh uh. <laughs> so you have that. Um, I want people in this book to read that you can do wrong and you can go so far down, so far away. There could be a chasm between you and the Lord. But he gave his son. And if you accept his son and you repent, then you can come back. Because no one told me, being brought up, brought up Baptist and Pentecostal, mm -hmm. that you could come back from making a mistake. Because mistakes were not acknowledged. So if they were not acknowledged, it did not happen. Well, that's a lie. It did. And so me, being a preacher's kid, I was a brat. I was spoiled. I was stubborn, prideful, and couldn't nobody tell me nothing. So some of you all are going to read some stuff in here, and you're going to be like, oh, my gosh. Did she really admit that? What, do you want me to be a hypocrite? Right. If I'm correcting you or telling you what is right and what thus saith the Lord, I need to first tell you what I did wrong. Right. Right. It's all under the blood. I'm redeemed, so I can talk about it. You can look at me funny, I don't care. I'm still cute. <laughs> God is still blessing me, and I'm still moving forward. I talk about a lot of things in here. I talk about sex, misrepresented, mis misunderstood, because it's a gift from the Lord. And I admitted earlier that I brought a child in. Obviously, I didn't wait for God. I didn't say I was married before. Uh, okay, then. We use sex for what we want to use it for, and then we expect God 